In a world where boundaries were carved by the weapons of bronze, the first human civilizations were forged with many of them leaving legacies that we still live today. In Asia Minor, the speakers of what they called Neshili or the language of Nesha came to prominence in the second millennium BCE as they founded the very first Indo-European kingdoms of Anatolia. To history, they came to be known as the Hittites and their state one of the greatest powers of the Bronze Age. This is the story of the Hittite Empire. Since prehistory, the region of Asia Minor was inhabited by various Hurrian, Hattian and other tribes. The first city-states and small kingdoms that developed in this period were either on the periphery of the great civilizations of the time, those of Mesopotamia and Egypt. During the 5th millennium BCE, new groups of peoples arrived to Anatolia from the north and gradually started spreading across all its regions. Speaking the Indo-European family of languages, these people were the ancestors of numerous Anatolian tribes that over time came to inhabit the better part of Asia Minor. By the late 3rd millennium, the Indo-European tribes of central Anatolia lived side by side with the old Hatti, both groups having established several city-states in the region. To the south, the great Akkadian Empire had passed its zenith and was heading towards its inevitable fall. It was replaced by numerous kingdoms, each attempting to build a great civilization of its own. Among those kingdoms was that of the Assyrians, who by the turn of the millennium established their own powerful polity known as the Old Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were allowed to set up trading posts in several central Anatolian cities. These posts were called carums and were separate residential areas that housed merchants who in turn paid taxes to their respective city governments. The main Assyrian carum was located in the city of Nesha from where the Assyrians coordinated their entire trading network across Anatolia consisting of more than a dozen posts. Another important carum was that in the city of Kusara to the east. Besides harboring Assyrian traders, Kusara and Nesha represented the core area of the speakers of the so-called Neshili, or how we today know it, the Hittite language. The nearby and linguistically unrelated Hattians inhabited the cities of Zalpuwa, Nerik and most notably Hattusa, alongside a number of smaller settlements. Another important city was Purushanda, which possibly may have been inhabited by Hattians as well. The Purushandan rulers appear to have held special importance among the Anatolian polities, carrying the title of great kings. Hattian and Neshite speaking cities were typically rivals, although rivalries also existed within both respective groups, where each city was independent and looked to further its own interests. By the 18th century BCE, the earliest recorded rulers appear in the city of Nesha. King Hurmili was said to have ruled until the beginning of the 18th century, likely having started his reign in the 19th century BCE. He was reportedly succeeded by Pahanu, who in turn only ruled for less than a single year. The throne was then passed to Inar, who is hypothesized to have reigned from about 1790 to 1775 BCE. After Inar, the kingship was passed to Warshama, who would go on and rule for another 25 years, until 1750. By the second half of the century, Nesha appears to have had rivalry with the city of Kusara. On top of that, the relations with the Hattian cities were hostile. Zalpuva to the north was growing into an important regional power, triggering tensions between the two cities. Those tensions eventually led to war. Zalpuva was ruled by King Una, who led his army and invaded the Neshite territory. The Zalpuvan king came out victorious. After defeating the Neshites, Una raided the city, from which he took the statue of god Siush, and brought it back with him to his city. 
it was clear that by this time the Nashili speakers were still militarily inferior to the Hattian city-states. This, however, was about to change. The weakening of Nesha was used by their eastern neighbors in Kusara to increase their own strength. We thus date the earliest documented ruler of Kusara approximately to the middle of the century. His name was Pitana. Not much is known about Pitana when it comes to his predecessors. What is known, however, is that during his reign a war broke out between Kusara and Nesha. The reason behind these hostilities is not known. The ancient tablets simply mention that Pitana gained favor of the storm god, which in turn caused the king of Nesha to be hostile. Either way, the Kusaran ruler marched on Nesha, and after a night raid, the city fell to King Pitana. Although the Neshaite king was captured, Pitana reportedly treated the citizens of Nesha with utmost respect. Pitana thus became one of the most powerful kings in Asia Minor, and his city, Kusara, a major political power and the foremost Nashili speaking city. In addition, Nesha itself was made an important center of the kingdom and quite possibly the base of the Kusaran military operations. At some time around 1740 BCE, Pitana passed away and was succeeded by his son, Anita. Just like his father, Anita was a staunch military leader. However, it wouldn't be only wars and battles that carved his place in history, but a piece of record that he left behind. His inscriptions, known as the Anita text, or the proclamation of Anita, represent the earliest known text recorded in Nashili, or the Hittite language. The writings are dated to the second half of the 18th century BCE, describing the mentioned campaign of Pitana, as well as Anita's own campaigns throughout central Anatolia, which saw him forge a great kingdom and become the most important ruler of the pre-imperial era of the Hittites. The tablets reveal that shortly after ascending to the throne, Anita faced revolt against his rule, as well as hostile coalition of the Hattian cities. According to Anita, he first soundly defeated the rebellion. And after the death of my father Pitana, in the same year, I defeated a revolt. Whatever land under the sun rose up, I defeated every last one of them. Upon consolidating his existing holdings, Anita moved his capital to Nesha and raised his army to confront the Hattian alliance. The Hattians were reportedly led by Piushti, king of Hattusa, and Huzia, king of Zalpuva. In addition to these, several influential cities joined the coalition, such as Ulama, Washania, Harkiuna, Salatiwara, and notably Purushanda. Anita wasted no time and marched with his force directly to the enemy. The Kusarans quickly defeated the ruler of Ulama and took the city before the Hatti coalition managed to react. The king of Hattusa then rallied his forces and marched towards Anita. The battle presumably took place at one of the cities near the Halis River. King Anita was victorious and the Hattian army was forced to withdraw. Anita then sent the spoils of war to Nesha and continued his effort against the Hattian allies. He conquered the cities of Washania and Harkiuna, among others, which were then destroyed and depopulated. A proclamation was made that forbade any of Anita's successors from resettling those cities. Whoever shall become king after me, out of Nesha, no one shall resettle Washania or Harkiuna. Whoever should do such thing shall become the enemy of Nesha. He shall become the enemy of the entire populace. Meanwhile, the war was not over. King Piushti of Hatti was joined by Huzia of Zalpuva, as well as several other allies. He also raised a contingent of auxiliaries in the city of Salampa. This time, the battle would be decisive. 
and so it was, as was the victory of Anita. The armies of Hattus and Zalpuwa were soundly defeated. Anita then marched all the way to Zalpuwa and subdued the city. King Hazia was captured and brought alive to Nesha. The Neshite statue of God Siush, which had been previously captured by Zalpuvan King Una, was now brought back to Nesha as well. Anita now assumed the title of Great King. Hattusa was now all but defeated. The city was struck by famine, the fate of King Piushti unknown. To Anita, this was a sign that the throne goddess Hamashuit had abandoned the Hatti and delivered the city to him. Hattusa was thus stormed at night, captured and destroyed. I took it by storm at night. I sowed cress on its grounds. May the storm god of heaven smite whoever should become king after me and should resettle Hattusa. The land of the Hatti was now firmly in Anita's hands. The great king then turned his attention further west. The kingdoms of Purushanda and Salatiwara were still at war with the Kusaran king. The ruler of Purushanda still symbolically held the title of great king, dating to the past times, and refused to recognize such status for Anita. Anita reportedly marched towards Salatiwara, forcing their leader to withdraw his troops and allowing Anita to raid the area and bring the spoils back to Nesha. Back in his new capital, Anita reportedly initiated several building projects. He fortified the city and built several temples, one to what he describes as our deity and another for the storm god of heaven. He also furnished the temple of Halmashuit, the throne goddess of the defeated Hati. Anita's inscription also boasts of a successful hunting expedition where he captured lions, leopards, wild boars, deer, gazelle and an array of other animals which were all triumphantly brought to his capital in Nesha. However, the time inevitably came for Anita to finish his conflict in the West. In that same year, the king renewed war against Salatiwara and marched against its ruler. The king of Salatiwara also rallied his forces and marched out together with his sons, taking position at the Hulana River. According to Anita, his army then went off behind the enemy and besieged Salatiwara with 1400 infantry and 40 chariots. It was presumably at this time that Salatiwaran army was also routed by Anita's force. The defeated ruler of the city then decided to gather his treasure and flee. It became clear that no army in Asia Minor could stand before the great king of Nesha and Kasara. The final campaign of the war was to be launched against Purushanda itself. Even to the Purushandan ruler, it became more than clear that there was no path to victory against Anita's forces. Before Anita reached the city, the king of Purushanda came out to acknowledge the Neshite supremacy. He brought the Iron Throne and the Iron Scepter and presented them to Anita as a sign of subordination. The defeated king was then brought back with Anita to Nesha, where he was to become an advisor to the great king. He received a seat of honor in Anita's court, sitting next to Anita himself in the throne room. Anita's campaign was finally over. He had won against all of his adversaries and now became the undisputed ruler of all lands in central Anatolia. While Kusara still likely kept the honorable position of the old royal capital, the city of Nesha became the administrative center of Anita's kingdom. King Anita passed away at some time in late 18th century, probably around 1720 BCE. His great kingdom, however, did not survive long following his death. It was soon fragmented back into several parts, with his Neshili speakers controlling the regions around Nesha and Husara, 
while the lands of Zalpuva and Hatti were retained by the Hattic-speaking dynastic branches. Our series on the Hittite Empire will continue, so make sure to subscribe and click the bell button to get notified on the upcoming content. If you wish to support the channel further, feel free to join us as an exclusive YouTube member. This way, you will help the channel grow quicker, upload videos more frequently and keep increasing its quality. In return, you will gain access to the exclusive members and Patreon-only videos, updates, pools, loyalty badges, ability to decide on the future content, and more. This was 1XTV, and we'll see you again soon.